Good morning, dear students. My name is Farhan Mazal, and today is 30th September 2021. Right now, I am with the 11th Cambridge class, and the subject we are studying is Physics 5054. And today, we have set our hearts to solve uh, MCQ paper, and this paper is May June 2021. One month, one, uh, one month paper. This paper belongs from the Zone One, or we also call it the Variant One. And the time allowed for this paper is one hour, and there will be forty MCQs. You have to attempt all of them. So let's start today's paper. The first question coming up on your screen is question number one. A list of various quantities is shown: um, this acceleration, displacement, force, length, mass, velocity. How many of these quantities are vector? You see, the acceleration is a vector quantity, displacement is a vector quantity, force is a vector quantity, velocity is a vector quantity. So, how many uh, vector quantities there are? There are four vector quantities. So, question number one, we think that the answer is C. So, our choice is right. Okay. So let's move to the question number two. A student determines the circumference of a football. Which instrument gives a reading that is the circumference of a football? Uh, calipers, a micrometer, a rule, or tape? Which instrument directly will be able to measure the circumference of a football? A tape, a measuring tape will be used because the measuring tape can be wrapped around a football and can directly measure the circumference. So, question number two, I think uh, uh, D is the right answer. So let's check question number two. B is the right answer. Okay. So let's move to the next question. A train sets off from a station at the time t equals to zero. The graph uh, shows how the distance between the train and the station varies with the time. Which statement about the movement of the train between the time t one and t two is correct? You see, it's a distance time graph. So this is your reference point. The train went away from the reference point. The distance was increasing, and after T1, the distance is decreasing. So it means that the train is coming back to from wherever you started observing it. So uh, because uh, the gradient uh, here, the the gradient is gradually decreasing. I think um, here the gradient here. Let me read first. Which statement about the movement of the train between T1 and T2 is correct? Its speed is decreasing and is moving away from the station. It is not moving away from the station. The distance is decreasing. You see, from T1 to T2, the distance value has decreased. Its speed is decreasing and is moving towards the station. Uh, the speed is decreasing. Okay, so. It's moving towards the station. B can be the answer. The speed is increasing, and it is moving away from the station. Away from the station is wrong. Its speed is increasing and is moving towards the station. The speed, I think, you see this gradient here. You see the gradient here has gradually increased. The gradient here, here the gradient will be zero, and then the gradient has increased. So the speed is increasing and is moving towards the station. No, not that one. The speed is increasing and is moving towards the station. After this, the gradient has started here. The gradient has started decreasing. So here the gradient is zero. Gradually the gradient has increased. It means the gradient of the distance-time graph is equals to the speed. So the speed is basically increasing. And it is the distance is gradually decreasing, so it's moving towards the station. So its speed is increasing and it's moving towards the station. So we think question number three D is the choice. So let's check. Question number three D is the choice. So hopefully you have understood this. This is a brand new question and it's a little tricky. Okay. So here we go. Uh, a coin falls from rest through the air and eventually reaches a constant speed. There is a resultant force acting on the coin due to the two forces, P and Q, shown in the diagram. Uh, what happens to the force P and what happens to the resultant force before the coin reaches the constant speed? This downward force here, this Q is equal to the weight, and this upward force P 
is air resistance. So at the start, there will be no air resistance, only the weight will be acting and the resultant force will be equals to the weight. The resultant force is equals to weight minus the air resistance. As the coin will fall down, it, its speed will increase. And so the air resistance will also increase. So when the air resistance will continuously gradually increase, and uh, the resultant force will gradually decrease. So at some point, what will happen, the air resistance P will become equals to the weight of the body. And at that point, the resultant force will become zero. So the P value is gradually increasing and uh, the resultant force is gradually decreasing. So I think C is the choice. Uh, question number four, C is the choice, let's check. Question of four C is the choice. Okay, a satellite is shown moving around the earth in the circular path at a constant speed, which arrow shows the direction of the force on the satellite because the satellite is moving in a circular path. And uh, so at every instant, uh, a net force is acting towards the center of that circle in which the satellite is moving. And that force is known as the centripetal force and it is always directed towards the center of the circle in which the satellite is moving. So the arrow here, which shows uh, that thing is D. So question number five, I think D is the right answer. Question number five, D is the right answer. Question number six is showing up on your screen. Which row shows the mass and the weight of an object on the Earth's surface? Gravitational field strength G is equal to 10 Newton per kg. So here we have four options. The mass is given, the weight is given in each option. So I have to, I, what we, are, we will do, we will calculate the value of the G in each option. So wherever the value of the G will come out to be 10, that will be our answer. So let me show you how we do this. Okay, so here we go. This is, uh, okay. So question number, uh, this is question number uh, six. So weight is equals to mg. So G value is the weight divided by mass. In the A option, the weight is 0 0.20 and the M is two kg. So divide 0 0.20 with the two, you get 0 0.1. In the B option, the weight is 10 and the M value is two. So divide them, you get five. In the C option, the weight is five and the, the mass is also five. So the G value will be one in the D option. The weight is 50 and the mass is five kg. So the G value will be 10. So the, the value of the, the option, the right option, will be, I think D. D will be the right option, let's check. Question number six, D is the option. Question number six, D is the right option, sir. Okay, so we are moving to the next question. The next question is question number uh, seven. Water is added to a measuring cylinder containing 100 centimeter cube of a liquid, uh, of liquid paraffin. So the volume of the paraffin is given, that's 100 cubic centimeter. So I said 100 cubic centimeter. So we know the um, volume of the paraffin. The density of the paraffin is 0 0.80 grams per centimeter cube. And that of the water is one gram per centimeter uh, cube. As the water is added, the level of the paraffin rises to 150 centimeter cube. The paraffin and the water do not mix, but finally, is the total mass of the liquid in the measuring cylinder. So there was paraffin whose volume was 100 centimeter cube, whose density is 0 0.80 gram per centimeter cube. So you can find the mass of the paraffin. Uh, the mass is equal to density multiply volume. In the same way, when you added water, the volume of the whole thing became 150. So it means uh, the volume of the water is 150 minus 100, that is 50. So you know the volume of the water and you know the density of the water is one gram per centimeter cube. You can find the mass of the water and you can apply the formula mass is equals to density multiply volume. So once you have the mass of the water and you know the mass of the paraffin, you can add them up and that will be the total mass of the whole liquid which is in the measuring cylinder. Let me show you, I have done this on a paper. Okay, so, so. 
me show you. Oops, this diagram is not that clear. Density of the paraffin is 0 0.80 gram per centimeter cube. The volume of the paraffin is 100 cubic centimeter. The mass of the paraffin will be density multiply volume, 0 0.8 multiply 100. It will be 80 gram. The water's density is one gram per centimeter cube. The volume of the water is 50 centimeter cube. The mass of the water will be density multiply volume, and that will be one multiply 50, so that will be 50 gram. So the total mass of the paraffin plus the water, that will be 80 gram plus 50 gram, and that will be 130 gram, 130 gram. So let's check what which option is right. So let's check. So 130 grams. So I think question number seven, A is the choice. Question number seven, A is the choice and A is the right choice. Okay, so we are moving to the next question. The next question is question number eight. A horizontal beam is pivoted at X, a mass of 200 gram rests on the beam as shown. The center of the mass of the beam is 50 centimeter from the right end of the beam and a beam is balanced. The beam is balanced. What is the mass of the beam? So try to understand this thing. The whole thing is 100 centimeter long. This beam is 100 centimeter long. So it's center of, uh, center of gravity will be at the mark of 50 centimeter. So at the 50 centimeter mark here somewhere, the weight of the beam will be acting here. Here, it will be trying to produce a, uh, clockwise turning effect. Here you have put a mass, it's center, it's the center of this is 20 centimeter from the pivot. So it's trying to produce a clockwise turning effect. So both these turning effects, they are equal to each other. So that's why the whole thing will be in balance. Let me show you how I have done this. Okay. So on your screen, you can see there the this thing is 60, this thing is 40 total. The total thing is 100 centimeter long. Uh, the weight uh, will be acting here at the center of the gravity, which will be 50 centimeter from here. And from the pivot, it will be 10 centimeters. This weight is trying to produce a clockwise turning effect. So clockwise turning effect will be weight two multiplied distance two. And the anti-clockwise turning effect will be W1 multiplied D1. The W1 is mass is given that's 200 grams. So I will convert this. Uh, so W2, uh, uh, that will be Mg multiplies distance is 10 centimeter. W1, it's 200 gram. I converted it into kg. Multiply the G value that is 10. So convert for converting 200 grams into kg, I divide it with 1000 and multiply 20 centimeter. The distance of this line of action of the weight from the pivot is to 20 centimeter. So you just do the calculation, the M, uh, Mg equals to 40 by 10. So Mg equals to four and G is 10. So it will go on the other side, it will divide. So M will be 0 0.4 kg multiplied with 1000 and it will be converted into grams. So the mass of this, uh, beam is 400 gram, 400 gram, 400 gram. Okay, so let's check. So I think C is the choice. Question number, I think of eight, C is the right choice. So let's check. Question number eight, C is the right choice, sir. Okay. So let's move to the next question. Where on the graph, he says, where on the graph is the limit of proportionality for an elastic solid? Hey, on, the x, on the x axis, you can see we have load. On the y axis, we have extension. And this is the extension load graph. Uh, up to point P, the extension load graph is a straight line, which means that the extension and load, they are directly proportional to each other. So after the point P, the graph has become a curve. So, which means the extension and the load, they are no more directly proportional to each other. So I think the P is the limit of proportionality. So P choice. Question number nine, B is the right choice. Yeah, question number nine, B is the right choice. Okay, 
So let's move to the next question. A sealed gas syringe contains a fixed mass of gas. The piston is moved and the volume of the gas doubles. The temperature of the gas does not change. What happens to the pressure of the gas? Here you can see that the temperature of the gas is not changing. And when the temperature of the gas is not changing, then the pressure and the volume, they are uh, uh, you know, uh, inversely proportional to each other. So whatever will happen, uh, with the volume, the opposite thing will happen with the pressure. So if the volume will double, the pressure will become uh, one by two of the previous pressure because they are inversely proportional. So let me show you how I have done this. I have done this on a paper. So let me show you. Okay. Now because the temperature is constant, we can say P1, V1 equals to P2, V2. The pressure one, suppose it is P, the volume one is V, pressure two is question, the volume two is 2V, it became double. The pressure became double. So the P2 is question, so V and V cancel. So this two will go on the other side, it will divide. So the pressure two is equals to half of the first pressure. So the pressure will become half. The pressure will become half. A is the answer. Question number 10, A is the answer. So let's check. Question number 10, A is the right answer, sir. Okay. The next question is, which expression for pressure is correct? The pressure is force divided by area. So B is the right choice. Question number 11, B is the right choice. Okay. So we are on the question number uh, 12. At a depth D in the seawater, the total pressure experienced by a diver is 2P, where P is the atmospheric pressure. At which depth is the pressure 4P? Let me show you the diagram. Yeah. Now, so when the, the, the person was here, so this is the level of the water, when the person was at a depth of D, the, the pressure at this point was 2P. This atmospheric pressure is P. At 1D, the pressure of the water is also P. So the total pressure is the pressure due to the atmosphere plus pressure due to the water. So the pressure at this point is 2P. This is given in the question. So it means if the depth is D, the pressure of the water will be D and you, because the pressure of the atmosphere is also one uh, P. So the total pressure will be two P. Now the question to us is that at which depth the pressure will become four P. So here on this portion, you can see I've tried to find P pressure due to the atmosphere, uh, P pressure due to the one D, another P pressure due to the another D, another P due to the another D. So here, P plus P plus P and one P for the atmospheric pressure. So the total pressure at this point will be four P and you can check how much is the depth of this water. That's three D. So the pressure will be four P when the depth of the water will be three D. The depth of the water will be three D. So let's check three D, three D, three D. So the depth of the water will be 3D. Question number 12, C choice, let's check. Question number 12, C choice, okay. So we are moving to the next question. That question number 13 is showing up on your screen. He says, the work done by a force F on a body is calculated by multiplying F by a quantity Q. What is the Q? You know the work done is equals to the force multiply uh, by the distance moved in the direction of the force. So A is the right choice. The distance traveled in the direction of the force. So the, that second quantity is this, the distance traveled in the direction of the force. Question number 13, A is the choice. Question number 13, A is the right choice, sir. Okay, so let's move to the question number 14. And it says, some solar panels have an area of 12 meters square. 
each one meter square of the panel receives 0 0.85 kilojoules of energy from the sun in one second. The efficiency of the panel is 16%. How much power do they produce? So let's check. I've done this on a paper. Let me show you. Okay. There we go. So the input, uh, the input energy is uh, 0 0.85 uh, multiplied 10 is per 3 joules. So that is the energy, uh, input energy for one meter square, but the total area of your panels is 12 meter square. So just multiply, so your answer will be 10200 joules. So the input power is equal to energy divided by time. This energy was absorbed in one second. So 10200 joules per divided by one second. So 10200 watt, that is the input energy. The efficiency of the system is 16%. The efficiency of the system is 16%. So the useful output power will be 16% of the input. So you will have 16 divided by 100 multiply the input power is 10200. So that will be 1632 watt. And when you divide it with 1000, uh, it will be converted into kilowatts and that will be 1.6 kilowatts. So the useful output power will be uh, 1.6 kilowatt. Hopefully you have understood this calculation, 1.6 kilowatt is the answer. So let's check 1.6 kilowatt, do we have that? Yes, we have here. So the question number 14A is the right choice. Question number 14A is the right choice, sir. Okay. A copper rod is heated at one end. Which statement describes how heat transfers occurs in the copper? You see, a copper is a solid and it's a metal. And so the in the copper, the heat is transferred from the hot end to the cold end by the process of the conduction. The conduction happens by two ways. And one is by the vibration of the molecules. The molecules net movement is zero, means the molecules actually do not move. They remain in their fixed positions, but the amplitude of their vibration increases. So they make their neighbors vibrate vigorously and they make their neighbors vibrate vigorously. So in this way, through the vibration of the molecules of the copper, the heat is transferred from the one end, from the hot end to the cold end. Another very important thing which is present in the copper because the copper is a metal and it has free electrons. So the free electrons in the copper, they can move, uh, they can flow from the one end of the copper to the other end of the copper. So the free electrons which are at the hotter end, they absorb the thermal energy and their kinetic energy increases and they flow from the hot end to the cold end. And when they reach there, because they have now the higher kinetic energy, they collide with the molecules of the copper and they make them vibrate vigorously. In this way, by the free electrons uh, from the hot end to the cold, uh, heat is transferred to the cold end. This is called free electron diffusion. So, which statement describes how the heat transfer occurs in the copper? Energetic copper molecules move from the cooler end to the hotter end, that's wrong. Energetic copper molecules move from the hotter end to the cooler end. Remember the copper molecules do not move. Energetic free electrons move from the cooler end to the hotter end. The free electrons move from the hotter end to the cooler end, actually. The energetic free electrons move from the hotter end to the cooler end. That is the right answer, sir. D is the best answer. Okay. So let's check. 15, D is the right answer. Our answer is right. The diagram shows a clinical thermometer, which factors affect the sensitivity of the thermometer, the constriction. The sensitivity does not depend upon the constriction. The diameter of the bore, yes, that's the very famous question. The sensitivity depends upon the diameter of the bore. If the diameter is narrow, uh, it has less, uh, uh, I mean, radius or diameter, then the sensitivity will be higher. So B is the choice. The sensitivity depends upon the diameter of the board. 
Question number 16, I think B is the right answer. Yes, sir. Question number 16, B is the right answer. Uh, which row is correct for a thermocouple thermometer? Uh, thermocouple thermometer measures very high temperatures. That is true. Response quickly to the change in temperature. That is also because the thermocouple thermometer is used where the temperature is very high. And plus another very important thing about the thermocouple thermometer is that it can measure a very quickly changing temperatures. So yes, yes. So I think D is the right answer. 17 D is the right answer. Let's check. 17 D is the right answer, sir. So question number 18. What is the heat capacity of our body? Heat capacity of the body is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of a body by one degree centigrade. Heat capacity of a body is the amount of thermal energy required to raise the temperature of a body by one degree centigrade. A very simple definition of the heat capacity. I think B is the right choice. Sorry, B is the right choice. So we were on which question? We were question number 18. And we think B is the right choice. Yes, sir. B is the right answer. Okay. Which statement about, uh, which statement about water is correct? Uh, at the boiling point, water vapor molecules have the same kinetic energy as the liquid water molecules. You know, the kinetic energy depends upon the temperature or temperature depends upon the kinetic energy. Uh, water vapors, uh, when the water will be boiling, the steam which is coming out of the boiling water, its temperature is 100. And the boiling water also has the temperature 100. So we can say that the kinetic energy, the average kinetic energy of the boiling water and the steam which is coming out, they, because they have the same temperature, so that's why their kinetic energy will be also same. So A looks the best answer. The, we can read the next one also. Evaporation occurs only at the boiling point. That's wrong. Water molecules become heavier when water freezes. That's wrong. Water molecules lose all of their kinetic energy when water freezes. That is also wrong. So A is the best answer, sir. A is the right answer. Question number 19, A is the right answer. Yes, A is the right answer. A water wave in a ripple tank refracts as it moves from the deeper water into shallower water. So what happens to the speed and to the frequency of the wave as it moves into shallower water, you know? Uh, when the water waves moves from a deep water from deep water into shallow water, the frequency do not change. Frequency do not change. Frequency only depends upon the source which is producing the waves. So when the water wave will move from deep water into shallower water, the frequency will stay constant. And in the diagram also, which is given in the question, you can see. In the shallower water, the wavelength has decreased. The gap between the wave fronts is less. So the wavelength has decreased. If the frequency has not changed, the wavelength has decreased, the speed will also decrease. So you see what will happen? The speed will decrease and the frequency will remain, stays constant. So I think the A is the best answer. And let's check question number 20. Question number 20A is the right answer, sir. Okay. Here we go. Light refracts from a liquid into air as shown. The refractive index of for the light moving from air to the liquid is 1.4. And what is the angle of incidence in the liquid? So the, you know, uh, this angle, this total angle is 90. And uh, this is the normal. And so this angle will be 90 minus 32. That will be the angle of refraction. The angle, uh, refractive index is 1.4. And the angle of incidence, this one, is the question. So let's check. I've done this on a paper. OK, so hopefully you can see that. So this angle of refraction is equals to 90 minus 32. That will be 58. So angle of refraction is 58. 
we know that the refractive index is represented with the n and n is equals to sine r divided by sine i and you know that in this formula upstairs we always put that angle which is in the air which is in the rare medium so we will have the n value is 1.4 the refractive index is 1.4 so we will have 1.4 is equals to sine 58 divided by sine i i value i want to find out so sine i will be equals to sine 58 divided by 1.4 so the sine i will be equals to 0.6057 and i will be equals to sine inverse 0.6057 and i will be equals to 37.27 which means approximately 37 so the choice will be b question number 21 the choice will be b let's check Question number 21, B is the right choice. 37. You can see that question number 21, B is the right choice. Okay, so let's move to the next. So I hope you have understood this question. Use the size. A ray of red light in air enters a semicircular block, which diagram shows the partial reflection and the refraction of the ray. So, to decide that which is showing correctly the partial reflection and partial refraction, uh, we have to draw a normal. So, at this point, I will draw a normal. At this point, I will draw a normal. At this point, I will draw a normal. At this point, I will draw a normal and then it will be very easy to decide. So let me show you. Oops. I think I have not drawn it. Oh, I have not taken this diagram. So let me, I have to do this here. Okay. So that we can do it, no problem. So. Let me take out the snipping tools. Let's take that into the paint. Let's open the paint. Unfortunately, I just want to take that diagram. Okay, so we have that diagram here. So what I will do, so I am, I will draw the normals. Not a good idea. So then I draw a normal here and the normal here. You see, you can see here the angle of incidence, angle of reflection, they are not equal to each other. So this is wrong. The here the angle of incidence, angle of reflection, they are not equal to each other. So this, the, the, this is not the correct diagram. Angle of incidence, angle of incidence and angle of reflection, they are equal. So this is good. But here you can see um, when the light came out of the glass into the air, it was supposed to bend away from the normal, but it has bended towards the normal, so that's wrong. Here, the angle of incidence and angle of reflection, they are equal, so it's good. But, and here, when the light came out of the glass into the, you know, into the, into the air, it was supposed to bend away from the normal and it has bended away from the normal which is a good thing okay so that's that's it d is the right answer sir okay
Okay. So D is the right answer. So that was question number, oh, sorry. So that was question number 22. So where's that? So we that. Question number. The number 22, okay. So this is how this is decided. It's not a very, I mean, straightforward, simple question. You have to draw normals and then you will be able to decide that how this is done. Okay, so question number 22, we think D is the choice. Let's check question number 22, D is the right choice. We are done. Here we go. We are done with this question. Question number 23 coming up on your screen. He says, which statement about the human vision is correct? In a normal eye, the image on the retina is magnified and upright. The, the image on the retina is not magnified. It's diminished, it's smaller than the actual size. In a long-sighted eye, distant objects form image in front of the retina in the long-sighted. C choice is short-sighted eyes produce only virtual images. That's wrong. Short sight is corrected by the use of a diverging lens. That is the D option is the best and the simplest straightforward statement. Okay, so D looks the best answer. This is the best and most powerful statement. Short-sighted is corrected by the use of a diverging net. That is true. And it's a fact you should uh, know this. Uh, uh, in a long-sighted eye, distant objects forms images in front of the retina. That is wrong. It is found behind the retina. So B is wrong. Okay, so D is the choice. We think question number 23. Let's check. Question number 23, D is the right answer, sir. Okay, so next question coming up on your screen. He says, uh, yeah. uh, which white, uh, white light enters a prism and forms a spectrum? The rays in the air are labeled. Which diagram shows how the white light uh, dispersed by the prism? Okay, so when the white light enters into the prism, at the first phase when it enters into the prism, the light is supposed to uh, split into its colors. It should be dispersed. And uh, when it comes out from the second phase, uh, the, the order of the color should be Roy G. Biv. So let me show you. It should be like this. The colors, the, the order of the color should be Roy G. Biv. Roy, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Red and violet. So C is the best option, sir. Question number 24, I think C is the right answer because uh, it has shown the right order of the colors and the colors are splitted when the light entered into the prism. So I think uh, C is the choice. Question number 24. So let's check. Question number 24, C is the choice, sir. Question number 24, C is the right one. Oops, I, I did everything. Okay, so the next question coming up on your screen. The sound from a ship is reflected by a cliff and echo is heard by a sailor on the ship four seconds after the sound is made. The speed of the sound in air is 320 meters per second. How far from the cliff is the ship? So very simple. I know the speed of the ship. Uh, sound and I know after how much time the echo came. So just multiply that uh, time and the speed, you will get the distance, the sound traveled in going from the ship to the cliff and from cliff coming back to the ship. And you heard the echo. So once you know that distance, then divide that distance with two. So that will be the distance between the cliff and the ship. Let me show you my work. Okay. So here you can see question number 25 coming up on your screen. The distance is equal to speed multiplied times. Speed is 320 and the time is four seconds. So the distance traveled by the sound wave uh, is 1280 meter. That's the distance the sound travel started from the ship went to cliff reflected 
came back to the ship. So that distance is traveled by the uh, sound. So the distance between the ship and the cliff will be half of this. 1280 divided by 2, that will be 640. Hopefully you have understood. So question number 25, I think B is the right answer. Question number 25, B looks the right answer, sir. Question number 25, B looks the right answer. Hopefully you have understood. Let's check. 25B is the right answer. Question number 25B is the right answer. Okay, question number 26 coming up on your screen. And X of a metal rod tracks the north pole of a compass needle. Which statement about the rod is correct? It is made of copper that is not initially magnetized. Copper is, if it is not magnetized, the copper is not attracted to the a magnetic compass, okay? It's not a track. It is made of copper with the south pole at X. If the south pole it X at X, then it will definitely will be attracted to the north pole of a compass needle. C is, it is made of steel that is not initially magnetized. That can be the answer because if that is of steel, it will be 100% attracted to the north pole of a of a compass needle. It is made of steel with the north pole at the X. If the north pole is at X, then the, it cannot be attracted to the north pole. So I think C looks the best answer, sir. So let's check. Question number 28, C is the right choice. Question number 28, sorry, I was checking 26. Question number 26, C is the right answer. Okay. Which diagram shows the pattern and direction of the electric field lines near a positive charge? In the positive charge, you know the electric field lines, they, they fan out, they radiate out, okay? So A is the choice. It's a very famous, straightforward, easy question, very famous concept. Okay, now, a positively charged held is a charge rod is held close to an insulated metal sphere. The sphere is earth as shown. The earth connection is removed and then the rod is removed. Which diagram shows the charges on the sphere after the rod is removed? You see, this metal sphere, because of this positive rod, what will happen here? Negatives will appear. The free electrons will accumulate here. Here, the positive charges will develop and induce, and here we will have negative charge. So when here we have positive charge and you earth it, so what will happen from the ground, the electrons will come and neutralize this. So then you broke the uh, you, this earth wire, and then you remove this, then you will realize that we have got uh, new electrons, more electrons, uh, on this metal sphere. So this metal sphere as a whole will become a negatively, uh, will become negatively charged. So which diagram shows the charge on the sphere after the rod is removed? C is the choice. Question number 28, C is the choice. Yes, that is right. Okay. Okay. The diagram shows an electrostatic precipitator. It can be used to remove dust from the air. What happens at the negative rate? You see when this dust particles by the, with the smoke comes out. So here we have that negative uh, metal grid. So when the electro, this dust particles pass it from here, the dust particles become negative. And when they come here, the walls of this chimney, they have uh, positive plates, so the particles are attracted to them and they at attach themselves on these plates. So what happens at the negative grid? Dust particles gain electron. Yes, that's true. The dust particles become negative. Dust particles gain proton, that's wrong. Dust particles lose electron, that's wrong. Dust particles lose proton, that is wrong. So question number 29, I think A is the choice. Question number 29, sir, A is the right choice. Okay, so here we have question number 30. 
a 100 watt lamp is switched on for five hours each day for three weeks. The cost of one unit of electricity is $0.24. How much does it cost to run the lamp for this time? So uh, let me show you my work. I've done this and it's very simple. Okay. So the cost is equals to the power in the kilowatts multiply the time. So the power is 100 watts to convert into two kilowatts. I will multiply it with the 1000. So the power will be converted into uh, kilowatts. The time is five hours and seven uh, days in a week. And there are three weeks and uh, the, the cost of the electricity per unit is 0 0.24. So just multiply then you get 2.52. 2.52 C is the choice. Hopefully you have understood that how we have calculated the cost of the electricity. The power is taken in the kilowatts. The time is taken in hours. So there are three weeks. Each week has seven days. Each day they are uh, operating that lamp uh, for five hours. Okay. So, and the cost of one kilowatt hour is $0.24. So the total cost will be $2.52. That's the C choice. Question number 30, C choice. Let's check. Question number 30, C choice. 2.52, let's check. Question number 30, C choice. Question number 30, C is the right choice, sir. Okay, so here we have question number 31. The information on the back of an electric room heater is shown. The rating is 220 to 240 volt. Uh, frequency is, uh, frequency is uh, I think uh, the frequency is 50 Hertz and the current allowed is 4.2 ampere. What is the suitable fuse rating uh, for this room heater? You know, the current, the maximum current it will take is 4.2 ampere. So the fuse should be little higher than this uh, value of the current. And so 4.2 ampere, the current is taken by the room heater. So the fuse can be five ampere. Question number 31, C is the choice. Yeah, C is the choice. Okay, so next question. The diagram shows a horizontal rectangular wire coil W, X, Y, Z between the poles of a magnet. Uh, there is a current in the coil in the direction shown. Which statement is correct? Okay. The side W, X experiences an upward force. We can find that the direction of the force can be found by using the left hand rule. Uh, the left hand rule says take your left hand stretch three fingers in such a way that they are perpendicular to each other. F, M, C, F, M, C, F means the force, M means the magnetic field, C means the current. And if I apply this left hand rule here, you can see that the, in the current is from W to X. So the current finger is towards me. The magnetic field is uh, from, the magnetic field is from uh, you can see that it is from north to south and my thumb is pointing upward. So yes, the WX side will experience a force in the upward direction. So you can see we have applied the left hand rule with the help of the left hand rule. That is called F, uh, left hand rule FMC. Thumb is F and the next finger is M and the third finger is C, FMC. So I think A is the choice. Question number 32, let's check. A is the right choice. Which energy transfer takes place in electric cattle? In the electric cattle, the electric energy is converted into heat energy. Question number 33. Question number 33B is the choice, let's check. Question number 33B is the right choice, sir. Here we have, he says the diagram shows a current carrying conductor between the poles of a magnet. 
the force on the wire acts downward. Four changes are possible. The current is increased, a stronger magnet is used, the current is reversed, the poles exchange position. A very tricky question. Which two changes made together keep the force acting downward? Both the changes you have to make. So if you reverse the direction of the current and at the same time you reverse the poles, the direction of the force will still the same as is in the first uh, situation. So I think the current is reversed, the pole exchange, three and four. You see a very, very tricky question, very tricky question. We are looking for those two changes that if both those ten changes are made simultaneously, the direction of the force acting on that conductor will not change, okay? 34D is the choice, very tricky question. You're right, okay. Question number 35 is showing up on your screen. In an alternating current generator, a magnet rotates near a coil of wire. So the induced electromotive force EMF in the coil is displayed on an oscilloscope screen. Which trace is produced as the magnet slows down? As the magnet will slow down, the amplitude of this wave will decrease and the time period of this wave will increase the amplitude will decrease and the time period will increase. So, D is the choice. Question number 35, I think. Question number 35, you can see D is the right answer. Question number 35, D is the right answer. A student uses a transformer to light a filament lamp using a 230 volt AC supply. The lamp has a maximum voltage rating of six volt. What happens when the circuit is switched on? You can see in the primary, the voltage is 230 volt and turns of the wire. And there are 300 turns in the primary. In the secondary, there are 20 turns. So first of all, let me test, calculate. Let me check how much voltage is produced in the secondary. Okay. Oops, I have not uh, taken that diagram. Let me. I have not taken that data. Just let me show you that I have taken that diagram. I will. Give me a minute. So uh, let me escape from here. Actually, I want to show you how that thing is done. And in that transformer, basically, you know, uh, It will take just a minute. You see, uh, if you know the, 
the formula that the voltage in the secondary divided by voltage in the primary and that is equals to the number of turns in the secondary divided by number of turns in the yeah. So that's question number. Okay, so here. So you can see. So that's question number 36. That is question number 36. So this is question number 36. So you can see that the Vs divided by Vp is equals to Ns divided by Np and very easily I can Vs is question 230 equals to the number of turns in the secondary, they are 20, number of turns in the primary, they are 300. So Vs will be equals to 230 multiplied 20 divided by 300. So the voltage in the secondary will be 15.33 volt. 15.33 volt. The lamp was only able to bear uh, six volts and you have provided it with 15. Point 60 volts, so what will happen? The lamp will switch on uh, with very bright light and then it will fuse, okay? So the lamp will switch on with a very bright light and then it will fuse. So let's check what's the option. The lamp lights up brightly and then goes out, yeah. I hope you have understood. Unfortunately, I have not taken the photograph of this question. So it took a little bit of time. So D is the choice, question number 36. D is the right choice. Okay. Question number 37 showing up on your screen. It says, which statement about the nuclear fusion is correct? In the nuclear fusion, the smaller nuclei come close to each other. They fuse into each other and they make a larger nucleus. And this is happening on the stars in the sun. So the nuclear fusion occurs at a low temperature. No, it requires very high temperature. Nuclear fusion occurs only between heavy nuclei. No, nuclear fusion occurs in the formation of the many stars. That is true. Nuclear fusion power, most electricity generating power station. That's wrong. So I think question number 37, C is the choice. <clears throat> Let's check. Yeah, C is the choice. Question number 38, in one radioactive decay, radium 226 decays to random, radon 222 as shown, which particle is also produced. You see here, the proton number has decreased by two and the mass number has decreased by four. So it indicates an alpha particle because its mass number is four and its proton number is two. Uh, alpha particle only. So B choice, question number 38, B choice. The count rate from a radioactive source falls from 4,000 counts per minute to 5,000 counts per minute in 72 minutes. What is the half-life? Let me show you. Okay. So that's question number 40. Okay, the question number 40 is showing up on your screen. <clears throat> you can see that uh, the count rate from a radioactive source and uh, initially, the count rate was 4,000 and one, one half life has passed. It will become 2,000, another half life passed, it become 1,000, another half life passed, it becomes 500. So you count how many half lives? One, two, three. So three half lives, the total time is 72 minutes. So one half life will be 72 divided by three, so it will be 24 minutes. So it means the half life is 24 minutes. Hopefully you have understood. D is the choice. 
So the last question coming up on your screen, question number 40, which particles are found inside uh, the nucleus of an atom? Uh, nucleus of an atom has protons and neutrons. Protons and nucleon. Nu uh, protons and neutrons. Neutrons and protons. I think D is the choice. D is the right choice. So my, my dear students, that's it. And we are done with this. So my dear students, uh, this that's it. Uh, we are done with the May, June 2021 Physics 505411 paper. It was an MCQ paper and that paper belongs from the zone one or the variant one. Hopefully this video, this session uh, will improve your concept. This will be helpful uh, to you for preparing your Cambridge exams. If this video is helpful to you, if this uh, video has, been, has improved your concept, don't forget to share the link with your friends and don't forget to share the link on your Facebook, on your Instagram, because that will promote my channel, that will promote me, that will appreciate me. And uh, so um, I will, this give me motivation to continue doing this work, which I do. So thank you very much, everybody. It was a pleasure teaching you all. So have a good